Hello, good evening, everyone. Thanks for your patience as we got things up and running, uh, both here and over on Facebook Live. Um, welcome to the virtual week of Youth Underground's Act Up and Vote Festival and to tonight's conversation titled Women's Vote Centennial Voter Disenfranchisement Today with Rachel Cobb, Brian Corr, and Peter Levine. My name is Courtney Adams. I'm the Education Manager at Central Square Theater. Tonight, we are broadcasting from the tribal lands of the Masa'ad Chuesit. We honor the ancestors and their descendants who live here today as we carry forward the tribal oral tradition of storytelling. We wanna thank those who make Central Square Theater and the Youth Underground Act Up and Vote Festival possible. The Margaret and H.J. Ray Curious George Fund, the Herman and Frieda L. Miller Foundation, City of Cambridge, Massachusetts Cultural Council, Cambridge Arts Council, the National Endowment for the Arts, Cambridge Community Foundation, the Carl and Ruth Shapiro Family Foundation, Cambridge Savings Charitable Foundation, the Social Justice Works Fund, Tufts Tisch College of Civic Life, MIT, Mass Humanities, and you. At Central Square Theater, art is our activism, and the Act Up and Vote Festival encapsulates that vision, empowering young people to share their voices, vote their values, and fight for the changes they want to see in the world. A donation tonight helps us to continue to do just that, creating timely, youth-driven theater. Please consider a donation today at our website, which we are gonna place a link here in the chat, and it's also pinned for our Facebook Live guests. Um, with that bit of housekeeping out of the way, I would like to introduce this evening's panel. Uh, two weeks ago during our live Act Up and Vote Festival week at Starlight Square, we were honored to present a panel discussion about voter dis disenfranchisement today. And that conversation was so interesting that we asked our panelists if they might join us again this week to continue the discussion. They kindly agreed and we are happy to have them with us tonight. Um, as we get started, uh, should you have any questions or thoughts to share, please feel free to share them via the chat or using the Q&A button here. Um, friends who are joining us via Facebook Live can also put questions in the chat there and we will be keeping an eye out for them there. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and invite the panelists to turn on their cameras and join us here in the space. And there they are. And it's my privilege to introduce our moderator for this evening's conversation, Rachel Cobb. Hello, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm delighted to be here with my fellow panelists. I'm going to uh, share a little bit about what I do and then invite them to introduce themselves and then we'll get the conversation started. I'm a professor of political science at Suffolk University and I teach a voting rights and election law class in every even numbered fall. Um, and I, I <clears throat> I've been interested in political participation since the beginning of time, um, but I became sort of roped into the world of election administration when in 2006, which was four years after the Help America Vote Act and six years after the Florida debacle, um, I applied for and received a grant to partner with the city of Boston to recruit young people to serve as poll workers. And I've been running a program ever since where we have our young people serve as poll workers. And that was uh, at the time the city of Boston was under a um, memorandum of understanding from the United States Justice Department. Uh, for non-compliance with the Voting Rights Act for not providing materials to linguistic minorities in Boston. So I came to, I mean, I, I sort of understood that on a broad level, but I came to understand the challenges of election administration and the, um, the issues involved in a much deeper way. And then in subsequent years did a study with some colleagues um, where we discovered that African Americans and Latinos and Asians in the city of Boston were disproportionately asked for photo ID, even though that is not a state law. So when we think about voter disenfranchisement, we can think of it in very big terms about policy issues that are, are that are state law. Uh, we can also think about it when actually I think that there's wonderful book, which I thought I had right behind me, but I don't, Carol Anderson's book, <clears throat> One Person, No Vote, where she refers to the tyranny of bureaucracy, basically, as, a, as one of the central challenges. So, to, so this evening, 
we'll talk about the forms of voter disenfranchisement today on the kind of big level at the state level, but also at the at the individual level and uh, and the ways that we can um, address it. So that is a little bit about myself. I will turn it over in, in alphabetical order going over to Brian Corr, who also has four letters and starts with a C and two double <laughs> consonants in his name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Rachel. And uh, thank you, Courtney and the Central Square Theater for um, having this uh, kind of revised, renewed panel. I'm very excited to be here. And so let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, again, my name is Brian Corr, C-O-R-R. And I, uh, my day job is I work for the city of Cambridge where I have a couple of roles. I'm the director of the city's peace commission, which broadly works on issues of peace and social justice and community building and supporting resiliency in the community. And then I also, I'm responsible for civilian oversight of the Cambridge Police Department. So if people have problems, concerns, complaints, we work to uh, try to figure out what happened or make it right, conciliate, mediate, investigate, whatever the case might, might be. And uh, I do lots of other things, but I also want to mention that as a volunteer, I serve on the board of Central Square Theater. So I'm very glad to be able to do something for this wonderful organization that I just love and have uh, deep respect for. So to say a little bit about me, uh, my background is basically as an organizer, activist, fundraiser for many, many years before I came to the city. I've been at the city of Cambridge since 2008, so for about 12 and a half years. But my very first job out of college, I was a door-to-door -door canvasser for the Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy, which strangely is very relevant again, but we were working to cut the military budget, stop the nuclear arms race, stop testing and production of nuclear weapons and US military intervention in Central America. And that led me to a series of jobs around um, social justice, political change, and campaigns. And so over the years, I volunteered on many campaigns, worked as a staff person on two different statewide referenda in Massachusetts, the uh, Clean Elections Campaign, which was to create public funding of our elections and get big money out of politics, and also for a graduate income tax to make our taxation system more fair in the state. So there's a million things I could say, but I guess to kind of move into the panel a little bit before I give it over to Peter, I would just say that in this moment with eight days before a national election, there's very little that could be more important than talking and thinking about voter disenfranchisement. So I'm just so glad that we have this opportunity. And um, I'm sure I could share some more about what I've done, but also what I'm seeing as we move forward with the panel. So thanks again for this opportunity. And um, uh, well, Rachel, I'll hand it back to you so you can hand it to Peter if you choose. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll just, wait for Rachel. Hand to hand direct. Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. Thanks, Brian and Rachel, for doing this with me and Courtney, of course. Um, so I'm Peter Levine. I'm up at the Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts, though I live in Cambridge. I'm very happy to be at Cambridge resident and pretty in, in, in involved in the city. And um, I guess part of the reason I'm here is because for a bunch of years, I was the director of this thing called CIRCLE, which is the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. I'll just drop the, for those watching on Zoom, I'll drop the um, link in the, in the chat. And it studies and advocates for really young people's civic and political participation. Um, and part of that is voting. And so now I don't work there anymore. I'm very proud and happy to have passed that over to a younger generation. Um, but they are crunching numbers on vote on, for example, early voting by young people right now. So their website has actually the numbers are pretty startling for the numbers of early vote of young people who voted early. Um, but um, more broadly, I'm a democracy guy who, I mean, I study democracy. Um, and um, I have done in the last few years, actually really since leaving, since moving away from circle a little bit, I've um, done some, I've been involved in some litigation on um, voting rights I, in the, the, the North Carolina voting rights case and other um, cases where I've been an expert witness. So I do a little bit of that, um, trying to basically as a form of community service, really trying to um, be helpful on some voting rights cases, usually focus on young people. Well, actually then, Peter, why don't, why don't you actually continue that and talk, I think actually the case of North Carolina presents a sort of broader case. So <clears throat> perhaps you can discuss that a little bit and explain what happened and what the, what the case is all about, the facts, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, uh, just to be clear, I had a really a bit part. I did testify in federal court, but 
uh, among other things, the court didn't decide on the basis of the discrimination against youth, So my, which is what I was talking about. So my part was probably completely irrelevant. So credit to all the other people. But it was an interesting case because what the, the legislature did was bring in a whole bunch of miscellaneous rules under one, they passed one law that had a whole bunch of miscellaneous rules, shortening the time you could vote and early and changing the, I can't even remember, there were a lot, like 20. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the lawsuit, the main thrust of the lawsuit was saying that the legislature intended to disenfranchise black voters, also young voters, but the core thing was that they intended, and um, they actually the 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 uh, plaintiff it was the NAACP and League of Women Voters, and they actually got evidence in the form of emails and so on through the legal process, the discovery process that showed that the legislature was doing this. Uh, and they were sending emails around, basically saying they were going to figure out the recipe that would reduce black turnout in the state. And so um, the so that was so. Um, it was it was an interesting case because each individual action you could was subtly get likely to affect turnout and I mean Rachel's a much better empirical political scientist than I am but and she would know more but I think that each of these was sort of hard to prove that it would really lower turnout but they were all chosen with the hope that they would lower turnout and the the court decided the um, court ultimately ruled that that was the intention and they struck it down. Um, the judge, the district judge, said that no, it wasn't the intention. He found in favor of the state. The appeals court um, reversed him, and then it went to the Supreme Court, where and justice and just before um, it was this, it was heard, Justice Scalia died, leaving a four-four split, and they deadlocked, and so it the um, appeals court wins. Lower court held. Yep. So that sorry, we're rem we're re remembering answer. that again now. Yeah, well, it's the works. only case yeah. I could really tell the story of in a proper way because I was involved. Uh, otherwise, I don't, I don't know my election law like you do, or both of you do. But um, but that was, but it was interesting to watch that play out. Quite complicated, and we have to look these things up a lot. But um, but that mm -hmm. it's a, it's um, the emails are quite a stunning feature of that particular story. But it does speak to this broader um, issue of politicians who sort of just pull various strings in big ways and little ways to alter the the core group of people who they believe will essentially reelect them. And that's one of the challenges, major problems of having the people who are in power set the rules of the game, <clears throat> which um, Brian on a local level, I'm sure you have encountered your Self, um, in your work as an organizer, especially um, approaching perhaps not about election reform per se, but maybe. Um, but do you want to say a little bit about your work as an or organizer and uh, dealing with power? Let's <laughs> have <laughs> that for sure. a big question. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a pretty easy topic. I think I can cover that in about a minute and 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, but in actual honesty, that's a really great question. And part of the, the type of work I did organizing was certainly the more traditional organizing around issues, but a lot of what I did was really organizing connected to campaigns and campaign finance reform and other types of political reforms. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that's really interesting about the current moment. I'll try to come back to that, but there are sort of three ways I like to think about how we make change. And if you're thinking about politics and campaigns and organizing, the first is kind of the direct campaign, what we often think about. An electoral campaign, there's a date, the certain, there may be a specific issue, or a campaign to win something in a community, to put pressure on uh, decision makers and get them to decide the thing you want them to. Uh, another aspect of power is really looking not at the specific campaign or the specific issue, but how do you create the infrastructure, right? How do you create the systems that allow us to better do organizing, to better reach people, to help people to understand the power that they have as communities? And that part of infrastructure building is also very important and often doesn't get as much attention because often rightfully so, we're very focused on the immediate issue at hand, uh, just like people are about elections. And then a really important aspect of looking at power is, I guess what I would call the power to shape minds and change hearts. 
It's really looking at the worldview or the ideology people have. And we've seen a ton of that over the last few years, really trying to shift people's basic assumptions about how things work and about how systems work. And I think that's where some of the trends we're seeing today really go back for a long time. But if you think about things like redistricting, which is you know, another way of kind of choosing the voters that you want if you're in charge of redistricting. And we actually saw Speaker of the Massachusetts House go down over that, over um, not even doing gerrymandering, but not being honest about gerrymandering. Um, and there were activists who tried to um, get the speaker out of that position for years, but what finally did it was a little kerfuffle, which turned into a scandal about redistricting and doing that unfairly. There are also all of the issues around convincing people that it doesn't matter if you vote. Uh, and that comes in many different forms, all of the voter misinformation, um, even in a sense, although I don't think that's what happened in Boston, but when you see a ballot box being burned, most likely, I would guess that's just more random vandalism. But if you think about all the things that are happening, and can you, could you have imagined even six months ago that we'd be talking about ballot boxes and where are the ballot boxes and how many ballot boxes are there? And can the Republican Party in California put out their own private ballot boxes? And there are just so many ways in which the security of elections, but more importantly, the idea that voting and elections will make a difference. These things are really being undermined. And to me, that is one of the deepest forms of voter disenfranchisement, just telling people and convincing people that not only does your vote not matter, your vote probably won't even be counted. And that I find deeply disturbing. Yeah, I think it is particularly, I mean, for all of the reasons you've said and others, such a um, challenging time because not only are there the forces of, of bad basically that are truly trying to undermine the democratic process and so discord and confusion and <clears throat> and deter people for all kinds of bad reasons but there also are the forces of good that are trying to make a lot of changes in a very short period of time to expand access to it but as I have said many times, one of the big things about change is that it's really confusing. Even if you um, are pro it, it is when the, the, the location of your polling place changes, when the new voter registration deadline is established, early voting is expanded, all of these good things, but yet, uh, or, or like if you've never voted by mail before, even remembering, did I, did I put, did I submit my application? Did I end up mailing that? Did I fill it out correctly? All of those things, super confusing. So, so you have this kind of whirlwind of, of confusion because it's just different and then confusion because people are purposely trying to, um, make you even more confused and angry and upset and scared and all of those things. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a perfect storm. <laughs> but we are, I'm hope rings eternal or, and I believe we are going to get through this. <laughs> um, I do too. <laughs> so, so Peter, uh, because you have spent so much time thinking about young people, there are um, a number of, um, um, essentially not obvious, but, um, but challenges that young people in particular as a demographic uh, face about voting that is different than, than people who are maybe 20 or 30 years older than they are. Can you speak to some of those costs of voting that are uh, particularly heavy on the young people? Yeah, sure. I mean, part of it is that the first time you vote is harder uh, because you have to figure it out um, and you have to do the steps like getting on the registration list and so on that, well, you have to register. Um, and then a lot of us who've voted before, we, um, we've already done that and it's just it's just easier. You also, until you've um, registered and then voted, the parties and other players don't know about you. So they don't, they're much less likely to reach out to you. So it would be, you know, our phone's ringing all the time. Well, we're in Massachusetts, it's ringing less than 
our, the, our friends in Florida, I mean, my, my wife is actually calling people in Florida. So the calls are originating from our house, but lots of phone calls are going out because, um, uh, because, because the parties want voters to vote. But if you're not a voter yet, they don't know about you. Um, so those are two obstacles. And then I, I, but there's more on top of that. Also, if you're young and you're living with a lot of other young people, um, they also have low participation because they haven't done it before. So they're not giving you the news or encouraging you in various kinds of ways. Um, if you're in college and you go away to college, and it's really important to remember that that's a pretty small proportion of the American people who do that, um, then you're in this really isolated group of other people who are also college students and that's tough because you start with a low level of participation. But if you're not, if you're living at home or with roommates and you're working at a job, um, you're at the bottom end of the pay scale and the beginning of your career and you don't have a lot of resources um, as well. So those are, those are some of the reasons I think. And are there um, policy changes that you think um, would directly alter the landscape to improve youth turnout um, or make things easier for our young people? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll just tick them off. Um, they have different levels of, I think, of research support for how how sure we can be that they would work, but I would be in favor of all of them. Um, one is automatically registering people so they don't have to do it themselves at all. Um, and, and Massachusetts is moving to, to that. Um, Pre-registering people. So you can, in Florida, for example, does this, you can register when you're 16. You can't vote yet, but you can basically get on the rolls, which is also really good because then you can register while you're still in high school and the high school can make that part of its curriculum. For similar reasons, I'm in, I know it's more controversial, but I'm very comfortably in favor of lowering the voting age because I think 18 is a bad time. There's a lot of transition. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people moving out of, certainly their school into something else and sometimes their whole house into something else. Better to do it to allow you to vote the last year of high school when they could also include that in the, high, in the, um, in the curriculum. Um, and then one more thing is we work a lot on civic education um, not only because of voting. I mean, there are a lot of other things. You, actually, all the the very that Brian gave a very powerful actually analysis of the different levels of power and how you work on them. That was very good, um, in my opinion. But that's the kind of thing you can also learn in school, in a different, not exactly Brian's version, but you can learn you can learn that mm -hmm. kind of thing in school. And we advocate for that. But one thing that we think you get is higher voter turnout when you do more mm -hmm. civic education in schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there evidence to show that? directly that that sort of causality um yeah there's there um there is it's not uh well we could get really nerdy on on methods and stuff and that would be hard it's it's a uh that, that way we'd probably lose some of some people it's not it's not the most decisive evidence because it's not experimental and so on but it looks like um when you control for other things the way we, we do in the business um getting more uh, civic education more closer to graduation does correlate with uh, more voter turnout early in the early years of adulthood. Super Probably interesting because the I, I didn't fade, but you know, you know, so does every so does everything good in life fade. Right. So we yeah. we try to do things for you know <laughs> make things better for a while, right? Right. right. And I'll, I'll just add very quickly, and you know, if you think anecdotally about our own experiences, how many of us went with one or both of our parents to vote as young people, as children? You know, I remember. Every time there was an election going into the voting booth, well, actually, where I grew up in Detroit, it was that machine with the big giant lever that you went and the curtain would close. And then I was in there with my mom. Usually it was usually my mom and she would vote and I'd look at what she and and I still remember that vividly, you know, as someone in my mid 50s. So those those experiences as children make a difference now we think about and then you know just everything Peter said I mean all of these aspects of how we create a culture of voting and a culture of mm -hmm. civic engagement so that young people just expect to vote um, mm -hmm. the way many people expect to go to college many other people expect to vote but we need to expand that to the entire yeah. society by the way some states don't let you in the polling in the, to anybody else with a voter including yeah. children so that's mm -hmm. actually a pol something that varies it's certainly well, that's a policy work. change right there. Right, but we can do <laughs> yeah. it in Massachusetts, but, right? Yeah. I, I think yeah. we can. I, I, have, I haven't lived here with young children, we can. but yeah. Um, yeah. my kids are grown. But, um, but yeah, but some states don't allow it. Well, it's one of the things that I have um, thought about that when I had um, each of my kids about 
four months later, I got this beautiful book from the Cambridge Public, I'm sorry, beautiful bag from the Cambridge Public Library, a um, canvas bag, and it said on the front, Born to Read. And it had in it a bunch of board books, including a great board book that literally, you know, one page was the one that you were showing to your kid, and the other one was explaining how to read to your child so that you could understand how to read to a baby. You know, a really nice set of information and also a, you know, some pamphlets about resources. And I have always thought, what a wonderful way to invite mm -hmm. someone into this world of reading, to invite them into the world of literacy. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we did something similar for our 18 year olds or whatever the age is where we vote, that you are now being invited into the world of citizenship Mm -hmm. uh, full citizenship and we're going to help you and guide you through that process that it's not something that you know boom you turn 18 and wow <laughs> suddenly the knowledge of <laughs> how all of this works is a, a light bulb right it's mm -hmm. it's um it's very foreign to uh so many of our young people and scary and and i think i you know i'll say um i think many of our politicians um, engage in um, shaming them rather than engaging them and and making them feel badly for not knowing rather than helping them learn the ropes. And that emotional um, distress <laughs> is something that you kind of have to then, you know, get through in order to then move on to, to feeling that sense of power that Brian is talking about and that infrastructure. So those are, okay, so so now here we are, 2020, eight days. Uh, we've, got, <laughs> we've got a lot of stuff going on across the country that is causing anxiety at very high levels to a lot of people. Um, are we worried about disenfranchisement right this very moment? And if we are, what form is it taking and where is it? And something beyond just kind of confusion either of you jump in what are we most hmm. well i guess i'll i'll jump in i don't want to take over the whole time but i yeah. i would say you know thinking about a conversation that we were having just before we got started on, on you know live part of it is there's no right to vote in this country i mean we tend to think oh i have a right to vote they're trying to mess with my right to vote we don't have a right to vote. It might be something we consider a duty or obligation. And because of that, it's so much easier to disenfranchise people. It's easy to make it more complicated. It's easy to make it harder. And I'm not that worried about Massachusetts, but when I look at what's going on around the country, um, again, some of it's there's been pushback, like when Texas said that you can only have one ballot box per county and you have counties with a half a million people, two million people, two or 3,000 square miles. I mean, these are counties, you know, half the size of Connecticut in some cases. It doesn't make any sense. So there are those sorts of things that are being done. They're kind of structural. But also there is this, this constant hammering away at the idea that government isn't really useful. I, I don't want to get into specific politics, but I would say part of, I think, what's happening with the pandemic is it's convincing people that the federal government isn't really very useful. They can't stop the pandemic. They can't pass a package to give people money. They can't keep the unemployed, um, you know, having their payments coming in. And so that I think is what we're really seeing come to the fore right now is the, I hope it's the fruition and not somewhere along the path, but the fruition of this idea that government is not really something that matters. In fact, government's a problem. It goes right back to you know, Goldwater in the 1960s and the Reagan era, and this idea that government um, is the problem, not the solution. Whereas I see government as how we come together to solve and support each other, to solve our collective problems and to figure out how to take care of each other. So in the current moment, uh, <laughs> try to get back on track. What I see is that constant undermining of the idea of government, that government represents us, that we are the government, that our collective will is exercised through the government, that is what's under attack. And in some ways, as consequential as this election is, I see a lot of what's happening around it as a very deep way of undermining the very idea of government, which 
to me is a huge, huge problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, Peter. <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think that there's, so as I just watched the news, I think there's plenty of evidence that at least some actors are trying to suppress the vote. So for example, Brian mentioned Texas, I think Brian mentioned it, um, you know, one poll one early voting location, I think for drop off ballots right in, in Harris County, which is Houston, which is bigger than many states. It's ridiculous, it's, it's ridiculous right? Th there's a different question about whether it's working. Um, some of the efforts are pretty uh, pathetic and some of them are pretty effective are pretty clever, but never, nevertheless, not working. I mean, there is a, there is a pretty strong tradition of pushback against a, attempted voter suppression. So, you know, so for example, some of the reporting from Houston has been that a lot of people are voting, and they they are uh, some, and there's been pretty intentional mobilization around. They're trying to take away your vote. So I think mm -hmm. I don't know whether how pessimistic I am about how things are going. I mean, partly I'm just it's very hard to track it, right? I don't know, if, Rachel, yeah. if you can better. Yeah, um, it's hard to know. But I do, I mean, I, I guess I'll say this. I, you know, I mentioned I testified in federal court and I've been in a bunch of other cases and done other work. I think it's absolutely outrageous when anybody tries to prevent anybody from voting. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it should be, it should infuriate in us, any of us and we should fight it. Um, that's because it's an individual human rights violation. I'm not sure that the efforts on the whole to reduce turnout have been very effective. Um, mm -hmm per se, and I'm not sure that, um, and that's kind of important because one thing that can happen, it actually kind of goes along with a, it's a, it's a different tangent on what Brian was saying, is you can get a feeling that there's no point in voting at all because the whole thing's rigged, um, or that, or you can misinterpret why elections happen. So I'm, a, I'm of the school that, for example, Donald Trump won the 2016 election. Um, I, I'm an opponent of his and don't have to pretend I'm not. And so I think it's terrible that he won the election, but I think he won it. And so I think if you start thinking that it was because the vote was suppressed, you go down the wrong mm -hmm. path. Mm -hmm. I was at a panel of political scientists, um, Rachel, you probably were in a different room at the time at, at the American Political Science Association. And in that particular group, the consensus seemed to be that we didn't have a democracy at all because of voter suppression. And, mm -hmm. and to me, that's, first of all, it wasn't an empirical study at all. So it was very much a bunch of political theorists. And I mean, I think the effect on turnout would be very small that and then also i didn't like the spirit of that because what are we fighting to defend if we have if the whole thing's a joke anyway it right. seems to me the reason that there are these battles over things like how many polling places there are in houston is because we do have a democracy um and the results matter and people will fight hardball which is legal but mean or they will fight they will cross the line and go illegal but they'll do it because the votes actually do count um, mm -hmm. So I just I guess I'm trying not to exaggerate the significance of. I, I hope I have the credibility to say I am as angry as anybody about voter suppression. But I don't think we should believe that our systems are totally rigged because I don't think they actually are. And I think it, that's actually disempowering message. Um, I don't know if you, you right. both nodded very politely, but <laughs> disagree. No, I, <laughs> I think uh, that's no. I think that's exactly right. I think um, mm -hmm. the. Uh, I mean, number one, voter disenfranchisement. I think it's important to 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 highlight it and and show where it exists and sue and do all the stuff that we have at our disposal around it. Um, but it is, uh, and part of it is for exactly the the reason of particular people are are being disenfranchised for particular reasons. But that is as old as the republic. And it has been the purview of politicians. So just last week, I was teaching the class on election timing. And, mm -hmm. um, and when we have elections, for particularly municipal elections. And I have to say, as a you know, person who tries to think through things, I think when I started thinking about it, I thought to myself, my gosh, I think I always just assumed that it had ever been thus that we had municipal elections primarily in even, odd numbered years. And, uh, federal elections, that that was sort of a, a norm that sort of came to be. Oh, no, no. L like everything with voting rights, it was politicians zooming in in the 1880s, particularly try as partisans reconstructing municipal government to make sure that a smaller group of people were voting so that they could be reelected. So th I think the important thing to know is that so many of the legal constraints on us are by design. 
uh, and, and to serve a particular set of powers and undermine another set of powers. At the same time, you know, the, the, we fight and engage for, for all of these reasons to, to overcome that and, and to, to, to be better, which is the whole idea of the United States, right? There's, it's an idea that we are going for. Um, Can I just say that, I, that, what, that, the, that voter, um, the election timing thing is really important, I think, it is one of the reasons that turnout in city elections is so often so terrible, Boston included. And that, that's one where you can be nice and bipartisan in this context, right. because even though Brian's right about the overall thrust of people who are against government also being against voting, I think, now, I think nowadays it's very often big city mayors who really like the very low turnout elections, partly because they're just, and they tend to be Democrats and often, mm -hmm. including sometimes very liberal Democrats. And partly it's just because they're incumbents and they like to get reelected, but partly it's because they can count on certain constituencies like, like unionized public officials, uh, unionized public workers to, mm -hmm. um, to vote. And so, and that's against my ideological interest because I would usually vote with the unionized public workers. I mean, my wife's a, is one, but, um, and I, 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 I would be proud to be one too, but honestly, it's not okay to reduce the to reduce the franchise in a city like Boston to a very small number of people by having an election of, of an off year. And Peter, you just yeah. reminded me of the graph that I saw over the summer that I should have used last week, which was ah. showed this yeah. dramatic decline in in participation in um, in city elections over since the 1950s. It is just it is just an enormous drop off, and so investments in cities have, have altered as a result of it. So it's. Um, a few years ago, yeah, one percent yeah. of eligible eighteen to twenty-four year olds voted in the Boston municipal election. Yeah. Well, uh, I and here I'm saying this publicly. I do recall interacting with a particular politician who sent me a letter in writing, which, for the life of me, I wish I could find because it was <laughs> where basically the politician said, "You know, I'm all for voting, but young people voting." not so much because they just don't understand the issues that we're dealing with. And, you know, if you have college students that don't really know what they're talking about voting, and then you read all of the reasons that people have always given for why certain people shouldn't vote because they just don't get it. It's the same argument said over and over again, mm -hmm. just rehashed with a different demographic group. So, um, you know, and I, I'm going to add uh, that what Peter was saying reminded me of a couple of things. But when I was talking about the Queen Elections campaign that I worked on, that, to me, this is actually that's a good example of a problem. And yet it's one that I hope doesn't make people too cynical, because I think in the current moment, it's very easy to think that politicians are all corrupt and they're all cynical and it's all about their own power. And with that election. We had a statewide referendum. We got on the ballot. I was one of the volunteers before I was a staff person. It passed and it passed with a pretty good majority. And the idea behind that the campaign planners had was that if we win with the big enough majority, it'll be like proposition two and a half, uh, which now has been here so long that people don't even think about it. But proposition two and a half in the late seventies was one of those tax revolt measures and it limits how much um, towns and cities can raise property taxes. And it's been a real problem, but this was different, right? Because this actually affected how legislators got elected. And the way people thought of it often was that, well, by saying this is queen elections, you're implying all the rest of us are dirty. And there were lots of arguments about mm -hmm. that. But so many people I talked to, good progressive legislators, didn't want it because they were afraid that someone who wasn't as progressive mm -hmm. was going to beat them. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the, the strange dynamics. Um, I'm not personally in favor of term limits. I don't think that helps either because then you, you don't have experience in the room. But when you have a system where people know how it works, they know how to raise money, they know how to reach the voters. And as much as Many people would say that not having to raise money would free you up to do more legislative work and really talk to constituents. There was still that fear that someone else might be able to take advantage of this free money and defeat them. And so even people who are, I think, coming from a place of wanting to stay in office to do the right thing, they still fall victim to these ideas of, oh, geez, if too many people vote or if too many people can run, if we expand it too much, it sounds like a good idea, but, but then it might not help me in my personal work. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, 
that's often what people make decisions on. Yeah. So I, mean, I say that as a, not to make people more cynical, but actually to say that it's partly human nature that people want to protect what they're doing. They feel good about their work. They're proud of it. They want to keep doing it. And we have to create systems that still open up democracy and expand the franchise and expand who can run for office and who can serve in offices so that we can make our democracy better meet the promise that we'd like to believe our country was founded on. Right. And in, I mean, just in, in pretty much every empirical study, when you look at who participates and who votes and how that happens, you can trace the resources and the money and the, and the goodies to, to the communities that are, um, that, that are, that are high participation. So it is critical, even if you think it, even if you're cynical. <laughs> to engage and to expand, to, um, to, to create more equity. There is a uh, little person who's just appeared next to me. So I'm going to sharpen a Halloween pencil in just a moment. <laughs> um, I, I believe, <laughs> um, so I think that is our cue. I see that it is seven <laughs> That's good. Saved by the pencil. I was just going to say, that, that seems like a natural moment. <laughs> in the conversation. Oh, thank you all so much for being here for this conversation. And, and for everyone who's watching here on Zoom and also on Facebook Live, thank you so much for joining our conversation, uh, Rachel, Brian, and Peter as well. Um, I hope that everyone can join us for more virtual festival events this week. We've got a community conversation tomorrow to answer questions about the Electoral College. We got performances both from the theater festival and our own East Underground Ambassadors. The full schedule and details are on our website. Um, quick reminder, you can visit our website or uh, the link in the chat or on Facebook Live if you'd like to donate to support the ACT UP and Vote Festival. Um, I think that's about it. This was a great conversation. Thank you again for being here. Thanks for, thanks for organizing. Um, thank you. Thanks for and yeah. everyone, have a great night. Thank you. And <laughs> vote. Thank you. And vote. Please vote. Make Absolutely. Plan. Make a plan and vote. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good night.